السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His household and all his companions May Allah bless them all and bless every single one of us My brothers and sisters This evening inshallah we will be going through a little bit of the lives of two of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were not from Makkah al-Mukarramah. The first, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. The minute you hear the name al-Ansari, you should know that that refers to those of Medina Munawwara who looked after the Muhajireen who came from Makkah. So al-Ansar were the helpers. They come from Medina Munawwara. When you hear Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, it is the name of the one who hosted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he came into Medina Munawwara. So as soon as we hear the name, we should know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he arrived in Medina Munawwara, stayed at this man's house. Subhanallah. The second that we will discuss this evening will be a great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam known as Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari from Ghifar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a lesson from their lives and to make us from those who are acquainted with their sacrifices and for us to be able to sacrifice as well for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, his name was Khalid ibn Zayd. A brother asked me a question earlier that why did they have different names? The truth is, they were called by the names of either their children or something important in their lives, some unique feature. So sometimes, for example, you have a person who had a son. If the son was called Umar, the man is known as Abu Umar. If the son is called, for example, Abdullah, he was known as Abu Abdullah or Abu Abdurrahman and so on. So it is the father of so and so. Sometimes, like in the case of Abu Huraira, he used to play with a little kitten when he was young. So they used to call him Abu Hir or Abu Huraira that the father of a little kitten, or it means a person who took care of the kitten, Abu Huraira. Yet his name was Abdurrahman ibn Sakhr. So in this case, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu, his name was Khalid ibn Zayd al-Ansari from the tribe of Khazraj. And he was a man who accepted Islam just before Hijrah. There was the second pledge in Aqaba during the Hajj, the year before Hijrah, and that was when approximately 73 men from Medina Munawwara, including or and two females, so making them 75 in total, had met with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the season of Hajj. At that time, they used to engage in Hajj, but they considered it a time of business deals and they used to worship their idols and so on, although they also used to go to Mina and they also used to go to the blessed lands. But they had changed what they were doing there into a business deal. And at the same time, just merrymaking, enjoying, feasting, and perhaps worshipping their idols and so on. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam met them at night. And he met them during the days of Tashriq in Mina. And he presented Islam to them. They had come specially to meet him. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was one of those. And he had accepted Islam. A few months later, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the hijrah. Because this meeting was in Dhul Hijjah, and these companions already started the hijrah as the year had changed. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam followed through three months later. In the month of Rabi' al-Awwal, he arrived in Medina Munawwara. So initially he arrived in Quba. He spent a few days there. He built the masjid. لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَن تَقُومَ فِيهِ Allah speaks of Masjid Quba. The first masjid that was built, Allah praises it and says that was a masjid that was built upon piety. The first masjid in Islam, Masjid Quba. Allah says it is better for you to stand in that masjid than in the other masjid that the people had made just nearby with the wrong intentions. So after that, after the few days, the Prophet ﷺ jumped onto his camel with his belongings and proceeded towards Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara, which is not very far. 
And the people of Medina, the Ansar, were so excited and delighted. Each one wants Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to stay with him. So the one comes out and says, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is my house. And the other one says, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, here's my house. I'd like you to be with me. Stay with us. You can stay for as long as you want. We will provide. We will give. What an honor. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the problem was sorted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He looked at them and he says, this camel of mine has been instructed to stop at a certain place. So leave it and let it move until it stops on its own and settles down. Da'uha fa innaha ma'mura. According to one narration, leave this camel of mine. It is instructed where exactly to sit. So what happened is Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was one of those who was also willing for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come to his place. The camel went around and each time it comes close to people, they were getting excited. And each time it passes, they became sad because they knew now it's passed. Until it came to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu's house and the little small space that he had in front of his house and it sat down there, subhanallah. How was the excitement? You can imagine. It sat down there. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got off. He asked whose land it was. The small piece of land belonged to two orphans from Bani Najjar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam purchased the piece of land and began to build a masjid there. And he stayed in the closest house, which was the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And there is a very interesting story about this powerful companion who was so lucky to have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stay with him for a number of days. Some narrations take it to a few months. But in actual fact, we don't know the exact number of days, but it was until the masjid was built and the houses or the rooms of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah be pleased upon all of them, were actually built. That is when he shifted. And when we say built, not like today, where it takes six months to build something because of how we do it. There, it took a few days. They actually, you know, cleaned the land, dug a small foundation, put up whatever they could, and a lot of it was actually with the uh, palm branches and a little bit of the stumps of the palm and so on. It was not with brick and what we see today. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, radiallahu anhu, he was so happy, he thanked Allah. He helped Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his belongings, and they were very few. And he says, it was like I was carrying the treasures of the whole world in my hand. When I walked into my house so excited with the belongings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that fitted in my two hands. Imagine, if we have to shift even now from one room to another, wherever we are, we have to get help. Someone has to help me with my bags and my belongings and what have you. This was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, afdalul khalqi wa akramul rusul. The most blessed of all creation, the highest in rank of all, even the messengers, the highest in rank. And this is what he had, very, very little. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my house has two stories. I'd like you to stay at the top because I wouldn't like to be beneath, I wouldn't like you to be beneath me. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, no, it is more convenient for me to be at the bottom. There will be so many people coming to see me and meet me. And every time they come to the top, it's not going to be convenient. It's better for you to actually be at the top. So he obeyed the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although in his heart, he still felt something. And so at night, when he got up, him and his wife, to the top, they served Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the day. When he got up to the top, he looked at his wife, and she looked at him, something was wrong. What did we do? How can we be on top of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It is wrong for us to be walking on top when he is underneath. So they couldn't sleep. And they, they avoided the center of that floor. When we say floor, it was just a small space that was on a, the, the higher level. Not what we have today. They avoided the center. They actually walked on the sides and they slept right on the side. But they did not manage to close their eyes. In the morning, they got up very early back to Muhammad sallallahu And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu goes and says, We could not sleep, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because we having you beneath us, how dare, we are so sorry for having done this, you must go up. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa again refused and again explained that, look, you know, it is more convenient for me to be at the bottom. Until when it came to the following day, they were at the top and some utensil broke with some water in it. And they were so worried because that time, you know, it was not concrete as we have today. If some liquid had to drop, 
it would go through the leaves and it would drip on the person who was at the bottom. So they were so worried, they quickly tried to wipe it up, although they did not have pieces of cloth there, because they were not so wealthy and so on. And in the morning, they went to Muhammad sallallahu and explained, look, we're finding it difficult. We cannot be up when you are down. And that is when Muhammad sallallahu agreed and he went up to the top floor. Subhanallah. This was the relationship they had. Beautiful, the respect they had of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, sadly, we say we love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we say we respect him and we become passionate and we become people who really, you know, get excited about the statement. But whether we actually follow his example or not is something that is far away. May Allah protect us. May he make us people who are not hypocritical, who only utter with their tongues what they do not really prove with their actions. My brothers and sisters, it's about time we showed the love with our actions as well. And this is why today, when someone tells you, I love you, believe me, nine times out of 10, they could be telling a lie, especially if it's online or on your phone. It's so simple to say, I love you. But really, like I always say, a lot of the times people use the term LOL, you know, laugh out loud. Some say it means lots of love, but whatever. Laugh out loud when they say it. I think almost all of us have said it, including myself, when we haven't even laughed. May Allah protect us from being false. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So if someone can tell you that all the time and they haven't laughed, I'm sure it's quite easy for people to say, love you and they don't even love you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from amongst the hypocrites. So going back to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu and his wife, they looked after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And after that, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa went to his rooms, which were adjacent to the messenger sallallahu alayhi, uh, sorry, to the masjid of the messenger, meaning al-masjid al-nabawi, which was quite a small masjid at the time. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was his neighbor, radiyallahu anhu. Now, amazingly, they had such a beautiful relationship that whenever Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wanted to eat, it was so simple, he would go at a certain time to the house of Abu Ayyub and they would have the meal ready for him. So one day, Muhammad sallallahu came out and he saw Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, And the two of them went to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu an, And the meal was brought. Or according to one narration, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari brought the meal to Muhammad sallallahu And Muhammad sallallahu looked at it. Now, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu says, this was enough for two people. Abu Bakr radi- as-Siddiq radiallahu an, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi So what I did is, I brought it forth and he told me, go and call so many people from the Ansar, 30 people. And I'm thinking, how am I going to go and call 30 people? But he knew it was the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he went across and he called 30 people. They all ate. And they accepted Islam, those who were not Muslim. And when they went, he said, call another, so many. They did the same. Call another, so many. He says there were more than 100 people who had eaten miraculously from the blessings of the food that was only meant to be for two people. This was one of the miracles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Similar miracle that happened to Jesus, may peace be upon him before, where a small amount of food was enough for so many people. This happened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on many occasions. May Allah grant us barakah in our food. With us, we have so much to eat. And we, we cannot finish the food, but still when we get up, we are dissatisfied. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us satisfaction with the little that we do have. And may He make us from those who are not extravagant or wasteful. Especially in the month of Ramadan. It is a month of fasting, but some of us spell it wrongly. We actually add an E to it, so it becomes a month of feasting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those. My brothers and sisters, here is Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He says, one day Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with Abu Bakr and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma to my house. And it was not the time of food, but when I heard their voice at the door, I quickly rushed. I was at the back looking after some of my uh, date palms. And I rushed and they said, we've come to have a meal. So he looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, this is not your normal time, but please let me take this uh, branch of dates. Now there were three types of dates on the branch. One was the dry date. One was the ripe date and one was the raw date. 
all these three have a speciality. So Muhammad sallallahu looked and he was amazed that these three types of dates have come forth. He says, Oh Abu Ayyub, had you only given us the dry, it would have been enough. He said, No, I wanted to give you all the different types of date for you, O Muhammad sallallahu He looked at his wife. He says, Oh my wife, you know how to bake. I want you to make me fresh bread. And then he went back and he slaughtered one of the small animals he had. He cut it and he actually roasted it whilst they were waiting. In no time, he brought it forth. So there was three types of dates. There was hot bread and there was fresh, freshly cut and roasted uh, lamb. Subhanallah. So Muhammad sallallahu looks at it and he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Oh Abu Ayyub, I ask you to take a little bit of this for my daughter Fatima. She hasn't had this type of food in a while. I want to stop there. The story carries on, but I want to stop there. How many of us when we're having a good meal, do we think of our families when they're not there? I think we do. It would be a sign of closeness to your family. You're eating something nice, you say, I wish my wife could taste this, subhanallah. Don't just say taste this, say I wish you could have this, subhanallah. I wish my daughter could taste this, or I wish she, they could have. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. you sent it for his daughter. So it would be a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam where you've tasted something nice, take a little bit for your family as well, or get it sent there. It is not only good for you and your family as in your relationship, but it shows people that the families we need to be concerned about. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Let's go back to the story. So he sent some, then he says, oh my companions, he's now talking to the three of them. And he says, wallahi, with tears in his eyes, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, Allah says in the Quran, Indeed, you will definitely be asked and questioned and cross-questioned about the gifts that we have bestowed upon you. This is one of the questions we are going to be asked about. The food we've had, how we ate, what we did, how we cooked, how much we ate, who we gave, what happened, where we got it from and how it was consumed. Subhanallah. So he says, if you would like to know the supplication to be supplicated when you are eating, when you commence, you should say Bismillah. Bismillah meaning in the name of Allah. And when you complete your food, you should say Alhamdulillah alladhi huwa ashba'ana wa arwana wa an'ama alayna fa afdala. Which means I thank, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has filled us, meaning we are no longer hungry, who has filled us and he has quenched our thirst and he has granted us so much gifts and he gave us from the best of it and he has bestowed us with his virtue. This is one of the duas that, is, that can be read at the, when a person has just finished eating and drinking. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who are thankful to him, not only in the dua, but even uh, uh, in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa looked at Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and says, I want to give you something. I want to see you tomorrow. Please come and see me. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu noticed that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu did not hear. So he says, oh Abu Ayyub, listen to what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says. He says, come back tomorrow. So the following day, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gave him a gift. A gift of a small or a young slave girl and told him, this is a gift for you. She has been such a good slave girl, so kind. She works very dedicated. Look after her and be kind to her. So he, he thanked Allah, he thanked the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they, he took this slave girl home. So his wife says, who is this girl? So he explains from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he told me to be kind to her. So she says, and how are you going to be kind to her? So he says, I will free her, so she will no longer be a slave. So the wife says, Subhanallah, you are indeed a blessed man. And this is indeed the best way, the correct way to do things. So he freed her, subhanallah. And this is something that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was expecting to have been done from Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu an. He was a man who spent a lot of time in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam defending him. It is reported the day he married Safiya binti Huyayi radiallahu anha, he spent the night outside that camp. 
in order to ensure that Muhammad sallallahu was not harmed. Also, when the hypocrites were talking in the house of Muhammad sallallahu in the house, eh, sorry, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa taala, some bad things about the Muslimin. Abu Ayyub al Ansari radiallahu anhu was the one who drove them out. He took them out upon the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, something I must mention about this great man, Abu Ayyub al Ansari. When Aisha radiallahu anha was accused of adultery by some of the hypocrites, his wife told him, Oh Abu Ayyub, did you hear what the people are saying? He said, Oh, keep quiet, do not mess your tongue. Do, do you think you would do such a thing, oh my beloved wife? She said, No, I would never do such a thing. So he looked at her and he says, Well then Aisha is far better than you, radiallahu anha. She would never ever do such a thing. So Allah revealed verses praising Abu Ayyub al Ansari. And the verses are, لولا إذ سمعتموه ظن المؤمنون والمؤمنات بأنفسهم خيرا وقالوا هذا إفكم مبين سورة النور الله says had the believers not said to themselves when they heard this that we will not be able to do this ourselves so Aisha is indeed better than us and they said immediately, this is a fabrication and a lie. Do not spoil your tongue with this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our tongues from being spoiled, accusing those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the virtues of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu an. He passed away in Constantinople or when they went for the conquest of Constantinople, he was one of them. And he remembered the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying the first to conquer Constantinople or the first army to go there to try shall be forgiven. So on his deathbed, some of the leaders came to him and he said, please take me with you until we get to the wall around Constantinople and bury me there. So that's exactly what they did. And today his grave is in Turkey what we would say, Turkey, subhanallah, this companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but his grave is somewhere in Istanbul. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease. There is actually a masjid there, and it is named after him, uh, Sultan Ayyub Mosque. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and forgiveness. He passed away approximately 52 or 54 Hijri, and uh, he was between 80 and 90 years old, according to the bulk of the narrations. This was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu an. As for Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, the other hero of ours, he was a man who was blunt, known for his bluntness and directness. When I say blunt, I am saying direct without any beautification of a statement. He would tell you, you are wrong. You know, with us still, we are quite diplomatic. When we want to say something, we would greet and we would say it in a nice, sweet way. Abu Dhar, no. He had no time for all that. He would say it bluntly. You can be the Amirul Mu'mineen, but you are extravagant and you are wasting a lot of money. And Allah is going to ask you about it. And I'm warning you and I'm reading this verse to you. That's what he used to do to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. And that's what he used to do to the other leaders. So much so that Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he never wanted food from anyone who was a leader or who had an official position because he used to say your money is contaminated. You have money, you have not earned it with your own hard sweat. You've just got it as a wage. Allahu Akbar. Yet it was not that what they earned was haram, but he was so, so particular about what he ate, what he wore, that he did not want it. We will come to a story inshallah in a few moments. But let's talk about how he accepted Islam. He was a dark, dark in complexion man who was quite thin and tall. And he heard about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he, there are two narrations, two main narrations as to how he accepted Islam. I'm going to mention one of them. So he tells his brother whose name was Unais or Anis ibn Junada. So he tells his brother, he says, you know what? Uh, I've heard about this man in Mecca. The next time you go to Mecca, I'd like to see what happens. I'd like you to bring back information for me regarding this man who is claiming to be calling towards Allah alone. So the brother says, well, I'm leaving right now. So he left and he returned the following day or a few days later. Now, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, his name was Jundub ibn Junada. And I think I will use that name for a few moments today so that we continue remembering the name Jundub ibn Junada radiallahu anhu. So what he did is, when he was young, he never worshipped the idols. He always asked questions about what the people of Ghifar had done. He was not from Mecca, nor was he from Medina. He was from a place far off known as Ghifar. And his brother had come down and found out a little bit, went back to him and told him, listen, 
Yes, the man, I went to him, he is saying something that sounds like poetry. He calls towards one Allah. He's a very, very noble man, high character and conduct. So Abu Dharr al-Ghifari, Jundub ibn Junada radiallahu an, he says, that's not enough. Why don't you look after my family and my belongings and my business for a little while? Let me go out myself and see. The brother says, no problem, you may go. So he went out to Makkah himself. But on his way, his brother tells him, remember, the kuffar of Makkah will harm you if you tell them you came to see Muhammad because they don't like him and they don't want what he is saying because he is saying something contrary to what their forefathers had brought. So Jundub ibn Junada, Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu an, he arrived in Makkah al-Mukarrama and he was worried because he had a little bit of his food with him, very little. And he didn't know who to talk to because he said, if I talk to this man, he might be for or against. I've got no idea. So one narration says Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu used to feed the people. Anyone who wants to eat used to go to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and they used to have a few dates and they used to have what we call raisins today. Raisins was something common that they used to eat. And uh, the, he fed this man and he noticed this man is from outside. Anyway, the man went away. Later on, it is reported that he met up with Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. Somehow he spent the night either with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu or Ali ibn Abi Talib. But he didn't say anything. And the following day, he came out again and the same thing happened until he was asked a question. The question was asked to him either by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an or Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an. That you know what? It's the third day you are here. What is it that brought you here? I see you're doing no business. There's nothing much you're doing. You're just here lounging around, roaming around. He says, look, I can tell you, but you promise me a few things. Promise me you will show me what I'm looking for and promise me that you won't harm me. So when the promises were made, he says, I've come all the way from Ghifar. Now, Ghifar was strategically lo- uh, you know, positioned in the northern part of the peninsula on the way to Asham, where the caravans of Quraysh used to go. So the people of Ghifar were known as highwaymen. They used to sometimes waylay the caravans that used to go up and they used to steal or take the wealth. So Ghifar, the minute you say Ghifar, there's a problem. Quraysh had a good deal with Ghifar that we are good people. We will give you so much and you don't harm us. So anyway, Abu Bakr says, Subhanallah, let me take you to the man. So he showed him where Muhammad ﷺ was. And now Abu Dharr al-Ghifari looked at him and says, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulallah. Subhanallah, who's this man? A stranger looking at Muhammad ﷺ. The first time the greeting, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulallah was ever used was Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu anh. And there were only three or four people who had accepted Islam, not more. This was right when Islam was in its earliest of stages. And Abu Dhar was the first outsider to come all on his own. And he looks and he says, O oh Messenger, please read to me some of the poetry that you have. So Muhammad Wasallam says, It's not poetry, it is Quran. And it is not mine, it is from Allah. So Muhammad Wasallam recited verses of the Quran. And Abu Dhar al-Ghifari just heard a few verses and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna abduhu wa rasooluhu. I bear witness, none worthy of worship besides Allah. What you have brought is the truth. It's over. I bear witness. I am a Muslim. Muhammad sallallahu was surprised. He says, Subhanallah, who are you and where are you from? He says, my name is Abu Dhar. I am from Ghifar. And Rasulullah sallallahu says, Subhanallah, look how Allah brought someone from so far off to come here, listen to a little bit of the Quran and accept the deen. So he stayed in Mecca for a few days with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. And subhanallah, he learned a bit of Islam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told him, Oh Abu Dhar, listen, do not tell the people of Mecca you've accepted Islam, they will harm you. Now in his heart, he felt, hey, I need to do something. People need to know that I follow the truth. He was excited, he was happy. So anyway, he went one day, a few days later, onto the, where the Kaaba was. And he says, Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh, O oh people of Quraysh, I announce to you that I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is definitely the messenger of Allah. So they beat him up so thoroughly. And they continued beating him up because they were shocked. A man from outside has come until Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu came and told Quraysh, Quraysh, stop it. This man is from Ghifar. 
You know Ghifar, we, we pass it with our caravans. You watch what his people will do to us. Now that they heard that we have beaten him up, you better leave him. So they left him immediately. They apologized and they were really quite sad because they, they knew something might happen. But anyway, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari went back to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told him, didn't I tell you not to do this? He says, but it was something in my heart. I needed to get it done. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sent him back to his people and told him, speak to them about Islam. Perhaps they will accept. Wallahi, he went back home. He spoke to his brother. His brother accepted Islam. His mother accepted Islam. His family accepted Islam. And a lot of the people of Ghifar accepted Islam. And the rest of them accepted Islam when Muhammad ﷺ was in Medina Munawwara. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he sent the people of Ghifar. In fact, he came with the people of Ghifar. They had come and subhanallah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa made a dua, Ghifarun ghafar allahu lahum. Remember this dua. Ghifarun ghafar allahu lahum. The people of Ghifar, may Allah forgive them. They accepted Islam, subhanallah. And in what condition? They hadn't even seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa yet. Some of them. And they had accepted Islam. So this was the man. Now this Abu Dharr al-Ghifari, Jundub ibn Junada radiallahu an. It's amazing how he was. He was a very hard and strict person. He did not like the world at all. And he was a person whom, when the battle of Tabuk took place, something interesting happened. The people who remained behind from the battle of Tabuk were all hypocrites or a few of them had a valid excuse. So when they got to Tabuk, the Sahaba were counting those who were not there and saying, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa this man is not here. He's, a, he, he's like this or like that. Maybe this one's got an excuse, that one. And they were about to mention Abu Dhar. And from a distance in the desert, they saw a figure looking like a man walking all alone with his belongings. And he was coming towards them. So they looked and they were wondering, who is this man? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, let it be Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Why Abu Dhar? Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Jundub ibn Janada, radiallahu an. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to smile when he used to see him and always greet him first. And whenever he was not there, he used to ask about him. So a little while later when he came closer, they looked and they said, Subhanallah, it is Abu Dhar. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua for him. And in fact, it was a prophecy that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had exclaimed on that day. He says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on this man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on this man. Ya'ishu wahdahu wa yamutu wahdahu wa yuhsharu wahdahu wahduhu. That he, Abu Dhar, lives alone. He walks alone. He, he lives alone. He will die alone and he will be resurrected alone. Subhanallah. And he walked all the way alone. When he came, they found out that his horse had given him some trouble. So he actually had to abandon it and walk. Subhanallah. So this is why he was coming walking and he made it to Tabuk. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Allahu Akbar. May Allah make us from those who are steadfast. May we be able to walk even for our salah. Even for our salah. Nobody is asking us to walk to Tabuk. We are being asked to walk for our salah. May Allah make us steadfast. We should be embarrassed. When salah is right next to us and we cannot fulfill. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this man, it is reported that at the time of Uthman ibn Affan, it was quite difficult for him because he could not bear the way people have started turning towards the worldly life and building their houses and palaces, whether they were leaders or not. And he always used to say, I don't agree with what's going on. You people are forgetting that we are supposed to be building for Allah. One day a man came to him and looked at his house. He had nothing in his house, no even furniture, nothing at all. It was just him and his clothes and that was his home. And he had a small animal that he used to milk for the milk. So the man asks him, Oh Abu Dhar, where is all your furniture? You know what he says? He says, Oh, I have another house. I, I send all my good furniture there. So the man says, Where's your other house? He says, Oh, it's my palace. I send all my furniture and my good stuff. I just send it all the way there. So the man says, But where is it? He pointed to the sky. He says, That's where it is. Which means all my good deeds, I pack them and I send them to the top. My house is there. This is nothing. He says, look, we are temporary. We are here. I am preparing my furniture and my buildings for upstairs, not for here right now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So at the time of Uthman ibn Affan, he agreed with Uthman ibn Affan to be allowed to go to a place known as a Rabada because he could not stand some of the people and they could not stand him because he was quite hard and harsh. Like we said, blunt. He would tell anyone, hey, 
this is haram and that's haram and you, what you are doing is totally wrong. And he would read verses of the Quran making them feel so guilty. And so it was right what he said. He did never lie, but it was quite straightforward. So the people used to complain to the Khalifa all the time. Look, Abu Dharr is very hard on us and so on. So he decided to move to Ar-Rabada, which is approximately 200 kilometers towards the east of Medina Munawwara. When he moved to Ar-Rabada, he was alone. Remember the hadith, the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu He was alone and people used to come and visit him and so on. And one day he was on his deathbed and they did not have enough to cover him. Him, his wife and his, his, the person who served him, the servant. So his wife was crying. Why are you crying, oh my beloved wife? Because we don't have anything to cover you. How are we going to bury you? We are so people, we are so few, we won't even be able to dig a, a pit to bury you. And there is no one here. So some of the narrations say that Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu said, you know what? You cover me with whatever you have and place my body on the road. And whoever passes by, you stand there and tell them, this is Abu Dharr al-Ghifari. This is Abu Dharr al-Ghifari, the companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they will bury me. So it is reported that a group of people came through. There are two narrations. One says, one group came through just before he passed away. And they offered to give him some kafan, something to cover him. And he refused to take the kafan, telling them, if any one of you have been famous, or you have been people who've worked in official rankings, and you've built yourself a house, and you've taken a lot of land and so on, I don't want your belongings. I don't want to be buried in something that was yours. So there was a young boy from the Ansar who says, I have nothing. And I didn't work for anyone and I, this is all my own belongings. That is when he took a piece of cloth, according to one narration. According to another narration, his wife and them, when he passed away, they covered him and they took him to the side of the road and they put him on the side of the road in the heat of a rabada. And a caravan came past with a man known as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. We have not yet spoken about this man, but inshallah we will. So when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an passed and he saw this body lying and a little boy with the body, he said, what is this? He said, Sahibu, Ras- Sahibu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Dhar, Jundub ibn Junada radiallahu an. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an who raised his voice crying, saying, Wallahi, I remember on the day of Tabuk, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, this man will live alone and he will die alone and he will be resurrected all on his own. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this man. And this is when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu had led the salah of janazah or participated in it of this man Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu in a rabada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless every single one of us. These were our heroes. Look at the lives they led. They built the palaces of the akhirah. With us, we are interested in building the palaces of the dunya. We are not saying that is wrong, but do not build the palaces of the dunya whilst foregoing that of the akhirah. Because we will always have to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some narrations of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. He was a great companion who narrated so many ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I had written down one of the most powerful narrations, but I think I will ask you to go and check on it. He says, Awsani Khalili bisaba. My best friend has advised me to do seven things, subhanallah. Seven things my best friend has advised me to do. And he mentioned seven items. I hope that you can actually go back and look into the books of hadith and go and search what were the seven items that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa advised Abu Dharr al-Ghifari with that he had made mention of. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.